This is Lecture 65D, From Chiefdoms to the Slave Stage in Hawaii, that accompanies Chapter 69 in Volume 4 of the ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism 2018, on Oceania. Now, in this chapter, that is 69, we will be focusing on two of the Hawaiian Islands primarily, Anahulu and Kauai. That's spelled K-A-U-A-I and pronounced Kauai. Now, the Anahulu Valley is a territorial segment of the Ahupa land division, usually extending from the uplands to the sea as the Anahupa, of uh, Kualoa. Kualoa is a segment of the district, or Moku, another land division that sections off portions of each island of Wailua on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. It's the name of the longest river on that Hawaiian island. Anahulu is especially important to us for, because it's been the subject of intensive analysis by Patrick Vinton Kirch and Marshall Sollins. In 1992, they published a two-volume synthesis of that work entitled Anahulu, the Anthropology of History in the Kingdom of Hawaii, and I have relied extensively upon their work, although the sociocultural evolutionary stage classifications are my own responsibility in this global textbook in the ABCs of Communism. Now, accordingly, for example, I describe the terms Ahupa and Boku as having come from the advanced theocratic chiefdom stage. Those are my terms and not theirs. On the northwestern Hawaiian island of Oahu. Now, these terms carried over when Oahu became the main island of the slave stage kingdom of Hawaii. Oahu, along with the other Hawaiian islands, had achieved this sociocultural evolutionary stage at the time of white contact. And that white contact began with the sail by on the 18th of January 1778 of UK Captain James Cook commanding the HS, HMS Resolution and HMS Discovery. Two days later he landed at Waimea on the island of Kauai. And we will be examining the archaeology and paleoecology of Kauai in this chapter and especially today in this particular lecture. I'm not sure how many more lectures I'm going to do on Hawaii or when, when because this year, that is for 2018, I've got four volumes to get ready for publication and last year we had two and that took me the better part of three months so I'm going to have to start now, the day after Labor Day, here in the heartland of Gringolandia and uh, get these next four volumes up to speed. Sooner or later, we're going to do a couple more lectures on Hawaii. But at any rate, Kauai was part of the islands of the Kingdom of Hawaii. At the time of Cook's first visit, he named them the Sandwich Islands, in honor of John Montague, who was the Earl of Sandwich and one of his patrons. On his 1789 visit, Cook was killed by Hawaiians, and part of him was cooked and eaten. At any rate, there are some differences among scholars as to the veracity of the manner by which this occurred, but it's an interesting story, which I kind of like anyway. Hawaii geology. Now, some six million years ago, in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean, volcanic activity bubbling up from deep beneath the Earth's crust formed Kauai, the most ancient of Hawaii's major islands. Over time, volcanoes dotting the island spewed magma that cooled and turned igneous rock, forming steep mountains. And rainwater flowed down these mountains, and as that runoff reached the Mahalupe Valley on the island's southeast coast, it encountered fossilized sand dunes where dissolution formed a network of caves. For more than 100,000 years, groundwater seeped in and eroded the limestone. 7,000 years ago, the sea encroached and a large portion of the ceiling of one of these caves collapsed. It left an open-air oval cavity in the earth that filled with brackish water and did not dry up until the middle of the 20th century. And unique conditions preserved a long dramatic story of geological change and biological invasions. Yet, very late on top of this came waves of humans that altered the island in radical ways. Paleoecologists and archaeologists working on this island surrounded by the high ancient limestone walls, are reading that record. And that record has everything from a 352,000-year-old lava flow to a styrofoam cup. 
for the past quarter century, husband and wife paleoecologist professors David Birdie and Lida Piggott Birdie, along with dozens of colleagues and volunteers, have been digging down through the black mud that fills a Kauai sinkhole, and they have uncovered millions of fossils. In fact, Makawai Cave may be the richest fossil site in the Pacific. Now, Andrew Lawler, a contributing editor at Archaeology Magazine, tells the story of Makawai Cave in an excellent way, and we will go to some of the illustrations at this point. This illustration is, uh, this photograph was taken by Lina Piggott Burney, one of the two uh, paleoecologists that have been doing on the, the research on this particular site at um, Makawahi Cave. And uh, the story, written by one of the contributing editors at Archaeology Magazine named Andrew Lawler, is largely what follows here in this particular presentation. He says, on a recent winter day, David Burney is shin deep in the tar black ooze at the bottom of one of the excavation pits. Now, he typically locates them at the periphery of the sinkhole against the cave's walls, where the stratigraphy is clear. He motions to me to clamber down a 20 foot aluminum ladder and gives me a history lesson as I descend. The recent upper levels contain thousands of artifacts ranging from animal bones to stone tools and carved wood, all of which were washed, blown, or thrown into the cave. Now, after the first few rungs, I leave behind the period of after Captain James Cook landed on Kauai in January 1778, having been the first European to have visited Hawaii. And then we have plastic, glass, and metal artifacts abruptly ceasing, and they're replaced by giant boulders, gravel, sand in the levels below, dated to about four or five centuries ago. These are unmistakable signs of an enormous tsunami, which Bernie and his colleagues believe originated from a massive earthquake in the eastern Aleutian Islands. Now, this event, no doubt a catastrophe for the people living in the Hawaii coast, deposited a great deal of debris and sealed off the prehistoric layers deposited in the cave from those of the later era of Western contact, leaving the material below undisturbed and uncontaminated. Natives and tourists had long known about the Makawahi Cave, but it was Bernie who, in August 1992, first grasped its significance for understanding Hawaii's long and varied history when he, Lida, and researchers Storrs Olson and Helen James from the Smithsonian Institution stumbled on the site while on vacation. At the time, the Bernies were at New York's Fordham University and had a keen interest in ecological history and paleontology. One afternoon, while walking on a nearby beach, Bernie spotted fresh footprints that appeared to lead into the brush. Curious but cautious, he followed the prints to a small hole at the foot of a cliff just big enough to crawl through, and inside he found himself within a giant oval bowl, but he could not see much else through the dense growth and the afternoon's lengthening shadows. The next morning, before the sun had reached the interior, the two couples were back with the bucket auger, which is a small hand-powered drill that can pull material up from below ground, making only a small puncture on the surface not greatly disturbing the site. The first bore went down 10 feet, and Bernie found three species of extinct land snails, important indicators of ancient environmental conditions. In the second sample was a small bird skull. If you got that much good stuff by drilling two small holes, then I couldn't imagine what was waiting, he says. I've spent much of my life looking for two things, lakes and caves that have fossils in them says the peripatetic scientist who had flitted in this pursuit from the North Carolina Sounds to the Serengeti Plains to the jungles of Madagascar before moving to Gawahi to devote himself to studying Makawahi Maka Maka Cave. 
if you could find a lake inside a cave, it's more than twice as good because you get the benefit of both types of fossil forming environments, unquote, he said. At any rate, Lawler continues, at Makawahi the conditions are remarkable, the alkaline limestone and the acidic groundwater cancel each other out and create the perfect neutral pH. This is the Goldilocks zone, just right, he says. Everything in here is preserved. It's like pages in a diary. And this process has been operating for thousands of years. An acidic environment would have destroyed bones, while an alkaline environment would have destroyed plant fossils. But here, not just animal fossils, but also shells, seeds, leaves, and wood, as well as billions of microscopic algae, pollen, and spores are embedded in the layers that extend as far as 33 feet deep to the sinkhole's floor. Since they settled there permanently to devote themselves to studying the cave full-time ten years ago, the Burnies, along with their team, have been working almost year-round to clear the thick tangle of foliage inside the sinkhole and dig small but deep trenches. Each bucket of mud must be hauled by hand up a ladder, while a loud water pump keeps the hole from filling up. Once up top, the mud is washed through mesh screens using garden hoses, and the remains are collected for cataloging and analysis. In the topmost layers, which go down a few feet, the team retrieved eight track tapes and Polaroid film packs, a bottle that might have contained an opiate laudanum, perhaps used by Chinese workers who snuck into the cave a century ago, and a coin dated to 1895. Below that, the team found a piece of glass and an iron nail, possibly bartered from the crew of a passing clipper ship on its way to or returning from China, probably in the mid-19th century. When Polynesians set out for new places, chickens were an essential part of the settlement package, providing not just meat and eggs and entertainment, cockfighting is still popular across the region, but also bones that could be made into tattooing, or sewing needles, or musical instruments. Polynesians sometimes left dogs or pigs behind, but they invariably carried chickens to their new destinations. Since domesticated chickens are not native to the Pacific Islands, the presence of chicken bones is a clear mar marker of human activity, and following the movement of chickens provides a handy way to track the spread of settlement across Polynesia. Now, realizing this, Bernie bagged the chicken remains he discovered and sent them to Cooper's lab. When compared with the DNA from other samples around Polynesia, researchers found that a distinct set of genes characterized the ancient chickens. The resulting DNA map reveals two distinct waves of exploration, one moving northeast toward Micronesia and the other moving east to Samoa and Hawaii. Rats traveling extensively with Polynesians as well but they could hop boats back and forth to different islands, making them difficult to track, says Cooper. Pigs and dogs, apparently, did not make it to some outposts, such as Easter Island. Now, mother of pearl and shell fish hooks found inside the cave site are among the oldest known artifacts of ancient Hawaiian culture. The mud of Makawahi Cave has also preserved the residue of charcoal that blew into the cave and settled into the muck. Radiocarbon dating of the samples suggests that charcoal is a rare occurrence until AD 1200. Its sudden appearance is another marker for human occupation and activity as people began to burn off foliage to plant taro and other staples. Cores taken from ancient stone-lined fish ponds on the island produced charcoal that provides comparable dates, clear signs, and possible confirmation that humans arrived a good deal later, as much as 800 years later, than many historians had thought. In the same levels as the chicken bones, the Burnies discovered large quantities of fish hooks made from bone and mother of pearl and the shells of 16 different kinds of mollusks. These artifacts are evidence of the earliest stages of ancient Hawaiian culture. Now, burning was only one way in which the new settlers transformed Kauai's landscape. Along with the rats, insects such as ants stowed away on their canoes, and the combination of human activity and changes wrought by the animals and plants they brought makes it difficult to imagine the island's environment as it existed before people arrived. 
but the cave is providing proof that it was once radically different. Standing almost at the bottom of the ladder, Bernie says that bones, seeds, and other organic material embedded in the mud around us are below the level of the Polynesians appearance on the island and predate their arrival. In the deeper layers of the sinkhole, the mud is very soft and can be dug by Bernie and his team by hand. The Bernie's work suggests that in contrast to the weedy fields where sugarcane was long cultivated, the area around the sinkhole was wooded, dominated by a species of small palm. The trade winds blew birds to the island chains, and through these ancient Hawaiian uh, birds had no predators, though these ancient Hawaiian birds had no predators, being blown back to sea meant certain death. Wings, therefore, constituted a risk for larger birds, and thus flightless species arose. More than 50 species of finches hopped through the forest, each adapted to a tiny ecological niche. Two sorts of small birds called rails crept along the ground looking for the eggs of other species to snag. The only mammals on the islands before humans arrived were small bats. Avians filled, with eco filled the ecological ditches that elsewhere were occupied by grazing animals, such as wild sheep and cattle, which could not survive the long journey across the ocean. The mallard duck gets here and suddenly grows ten times as large, stops flying, develops a beak like a tortoise, and goes out and eats the vegetation, Bertie says, gesturing up through the hole. It's a laboratory of evolution. The island's most fearsome predator was a type of long-legged owl that caught what flying birds there were in mid-air during the day. There were no nocturnal rodents to eat and pierced their skulls with pincer claws. You can tell by the holes in the skulls of the victims, says Bernie. By now, we were standing at the bottom of one of the excavation trenches with cool muck rising halfway to our knees. Eventually, we climb back up, passing the sentries as we go. When we emerge from the pit, Bernie's legs are caked in the black ooze and his black helmet is spotted with dried dirt. He ambles over to the volunteers, sorting through the mud, using garden hoses and rectangular boxes with one sixteenth inch mesh. Don't save every last little snail, but every bird bone and every seed we want to keep, he says to one woman. The biggest problem is that people try to screen too much at once, he explains. Just keep it to a double handful so you don't miss anything. Now, archaeologists have long suspected that the arrival of humans on Hawaii spelled doom for innumerable plant and animal species. Nearly four dozen bird species, many of them extinct, have been recovered from Makawahi Cave and other excavations, particularly along the coastal plains, confirm the rapid transformation of the environment once people got there. Though the original settlers likely were a small band of a hundred people or so, based on genetic data, rats rapidly populated the islands, posing a deadly threat to the large flightless birds vulnerable to scurrying mammals. The rats also quickly ate the seeds of the native palms, while humans may have overexploited the trees for thatch, causing them to almost disappear from the island. Early engravings made by Europeans who began coming to Hawaii in the late 1700s show the area around Makawahi Cave to be virtually treeless by this point. Coastal plains had been transformed by way of irrigation and ponds and mass burning had driven the forest back to areas too steep to cultivate. By the time the Europeans arrived, 600 or so years after the island's first settlers, Hawaiians numbered perhaps 200,000 or more people, and the landscape was a combination of field and forest with few signs of the strange birds that once dominated the chain. One of the surprising finds Bernie and his colleague, Australia, Australian paleoentomologist Nick Porch of Deakin University, have made is that the accidental introduction of insects, particularly ants, may have devastated the native species of beetles, many of which were wingless and therefore defenseless against the invaders. It was insect Armageddon, Bernie says, when people come to a new land there is always mass extinction. Although today only a few native species of plants and animals 
survive in the lowlands of Kauai, the Burnies are working hard to change this. The land that includes the cave complex is owned by the Grove Farm Company, but is now managed by the nonprofit Makawahi Cave Reserve, which the Burnies created. In combination with their archaeological work, they are trying to bring ancient Hawaii back to life, at least on a small scale. And inside the sinkhole, based on what they have found during more than two decades of excavation, they are slowly replacing plants brought by Europeans with both native Hawaiian and Polynesian species. In acres of plant restorations that Lida Piggott, Bernie, has created outside of the cave, she and a host of volunteers have planted examples of native plants the Bernies identified in the cave's fossil record. These species had retreated into largely inaccessible areas but can thrive in the lowlands if given a chance. The reserve is also home to a few acres of traditional taro and other early Polynesian crops, as well as native palms and indigenous flowering plants that have replaced what was a 200-year monoculture of sugarcane. More than, than 20,000 visitors, including many students, come to Makawahi Cave each year to rediscover Hawaii's lost past. There they learn to plant traditional crops such as bananas and breadfruit, and they visit the Bernie's fenced restoration containing not only newly cultivated native plants, but also a dozen and a half tortoises that mimic the feeding habits of the long extinct grazing birds and keep invasive feeds weeds at bay. For Bernie, the effort is an innovative way to use archaeological and paleontological data to restore native species, species to the landscape and revive ancient practices. I'm just as much interested in the future as the past, he says. As we part, Bernie is off to feed his chickens before dusk. Andrew Dollar, as I mentioned before, is a contributing editor at Archaeology Magazine and the author of the newly published Why Did the Chicken Cross the Road? The Epic Saga of the Bird that Powers Civilization, which is now available at Amazon in paperback. Now, turning to the historical ethnography for Hawaii, Hawaii changed rapidly as it responded to the growing global capitalist stage. Capitalist trade routes and markets crisscrossed the Hawaiian Islands. Our old friend from Stone Age Economics, Marshall Solomons, and Patrick B. Kirch, a leading archaeologist of Oceania, have written the classic monumental study in two volumes, Anahulu, the Anthropology of History in the Kingdom of Hawaii. Their work follows this transformation of a slave stage kingdom founded by King Kamehameha in the Anahulu River Valley of northwestern Oahu. In Volume 1, Solomons describes the effects of the encounter with the imperial forces of commerce and Christianity on the culture then extant on the human Hawaiian people, specifically the structure of the kingdom and the daily life of rulers and ordinary people. Volume 2 examines the material record of changes in local social organization, economy and production, population and domestic settlement arrangements. Simple chiefdom Polynesians discovered Hawaii in a journey starting from the Society Islands around A.D. 1025. After a stop of three quarters of a century in the Marquesas Islands, they continued on their way during the A.D. 1100s, finally arriving in Hawaii between 12, A.D. 1219 and 1266. Therefore, the period of eastern and northern Polynesian colonization took place in a shorter period of two waves, the first wave arriving in the Society Islands A.D. 1025 to 1120, then after 75 years, dispersal continued in one major pulse to all remaining islands. According to this research, settlement of the Hawaiian Islands took place between A.D. 1219 and 1266. This rapid colonization accounts for the remarkable, remarkable uniformity of East Polynesia culture, biology, and language. Rock shelters in the middle Anahulu Valley date to A.D. 1300. It is this valley on Oahu Island in the, Wa the Waialua District that is the subject of Professors Kirch and Solon's monumental study that I just mentioned in two volumes, Anahulu, the Anthropology of History in the Kingdom of Hawaii, archaeological evidence from abandoned habitation sites on leeward Hawaiian I Hawaii Island. 
and Kawalawi Island demonstrates arrested population growth because of island life and had reached 100,000 to 150,000 before Captain James Cook's arrival in 1778. Now the population curve can be divided into three parts. First, or one, pre-settlement, where there were no people. Second, the initial settlement growth phase of approximately 100 people around 1150 A.D. to the population peak in 1450 of approximately 150,000 people. And the third phase between 1450 to 1778 that reflected a relatively stable population. As the population grew, so did their forest clearing by burning and their building of heiau, or temples. The paleo-environmental data showing that showed that during the period 1450 to 1778, the construction of heiau temple pace slowed dramatically as well as the clearing of agricultural land. Accordingly, the estimated population in 1778 with Cook's arrival was between 110,000 and 150,000. Along the way, the colonists brought clothing, plants called canoe plants, and livestock. They established settlements along the coasts and larger valleys. Upon their arrival, the settlers grew taro, they call callo, a banana that they call maya, niu, or coconut, ulu, breadfruit. For meat, they raised pigs, called pua, and chicken, they call moa, and an extinct, extinct breed of pariah dog called ilio, the poi dog. Meats were eaten less than fruits, vegetables, and seafood. Now, popular condiments included salt, acai, uh, ground kukunui, <coughs> limu, or seaweed, and sugar cane, or coke, which was used as both a sweet and a medicine. In addition to the foods they brought, the settlers also acquired the sweet potato, uala, that arrived from the New World, wind-blown on waves along the road of the winds. The Pacific Rat accompanied humans on their journey to Hawaii, and Professor, D Professor David Burry has proved that humans brought them. The rats then killed off many native species of birds, plants, and large land, land animals, as we have already seen. Now, the simple chieftain people were first arrivals in Hawaii. And they had evolved to that level socioculturally, uh, socio and the task of organizing and conducting long-distance South Pacific exploration would have encouraged primitive, primitive communist tribal mariner agriculturalists to select a single chief with adequate consigliore, and so the simple chiefdoms had emerged before they arrived in Hawaii. And upon arrival in Hawaii, the estuaries and streams were made into fish ponds by these early Polynesian settlers. Packed earth and cut stone were used to create these habitats, making Polynesians some of the earliest, if not the first, aquaculturists. Over the course of the last millennium, Hawaii's, Hawaiians undertook a large-scale canal-fed pond field irrigation projects for tallow or taro cultivation. Life was good and food and shelter materials were plentiful. As soon as they arrived, the new settlers built hale, that is homes, and hea, or temples. Archaeology shows us that the first settlements were on the southern end of the big island of Hawaii. Thereafter, as population, populations continued to increase, they quickly extended northwards along the sea coast and into the easily accessible river valleys and settlements were made further inland. At this time, with the islands being so small, the population was very dense. The sheer population pressure on top of the psychological change from altruism to self-interest that always accompanies professional specialization cleared the way to completion of the transition from primitive communism. Simple chiefdoms would become advanced theocratically, theocratic socially ranked chiefdoms, or ATCs, for the same reasons in Hawaii as every, everywhere else in the world where we have continued, uh, where we have a continued advance. Once that happened, ranks began to fully separate from the mass of commoners. Class division was inevitable, and Hawaii entered the slave stage as a series of kingdoms. The four biggest islands of Hawaii 
Maui Kauai and Oahi, Oahu were generally ruled by their own Alinu supreme ruler with lower ranking subordinate chiefs called Ali, Amoki, Amok, ruling individual districts with land agents called Konohiki. All these dynasties were integrated and regarded all the Hawaiian people and possibly all humans as descendants of legendary parents, Wakia symbolizing the air and his wife Papa symbolizing the earth. Up to the late 1700s, the island of Hawaii was ruled by one line descended from Uililoa. At the death of Kiawahi Kahaya, Kaboku, a lower ranking chief, Alapaniwi overthrew the two sons of the former ruler who were next in line as the island's Alanui. Assuming five generations per century, the Ale Amuko dynasties were around three centuries old at A.D. 1800. The Tunisian settlement of the Hawaiian Islands is believed to have taken place in the A.D. 1200s. The Ali and other social castes were presumably established during this period. And the simple chief of Hawaiian economy became complex over time as people specialized. This specialization of labor was planned generally, generationally by the chiefs and their consigliori. Generations of families became committed to careers as roof thatchers, house builders, stone grinders, canoe builders, and bird catchers who would make the feather cloaks of the Ali advanced theocratic chiefs, or who oversaw the specialization of entire islands in certain skilled trades. For example, Oahu became the chief kapa, tarpa, that is a kappa bark cloth manufacturer. Maui Island became the chief canoe manufacturer. The island of Hawaii produced bales of dried fish. All of this professional specialization now constituted production for exchange. ATC religion held ancient Hawaii society together, affecting habits, lifestyles, work methods, social policy, and law. The legal system was based on religious kapu, kapu or taboos. There was a correct way to live, to worship, and even to eat Examples of kapu included the provision that men and women could not eat together. The Aikapu religion, that is. Fishing was limited to specified seasons of the year. The shadow of the Ali'i must not be touched as it was stealing his mind. The rigidity of the kapu system may have come after a second wave of migration in A.D. 1000 to 1300, where different religions and systems were shared between Hawaii and the Society Islands. Hawaii was influenced by the Tahitian chiefs, so the Kapu system became stricter and the social structure changed. Human sacrifice became a part of their new religious observance and the Ali would have gained more power over the council of experts on the islands. Kapu was derived from traits, traditions, and beliefs from Hawaiian worship of gods, demigods, and ancestral men. The forces of nature were personified as the main gods of, of Ki, Ku, that is the god of war, Kane, the god of light and life, Kanaloa, the god of death, and Lono, god of peace and growth. Well-known lesser gods included Pele, goddess of fire, and her sister, the Hayaka, goddess of dance. In a famous creation story, the demigod Maui fished the islands of Hawaii from the sea after a little mistake he made on a fishing trip. From Haleakala, Maui ensnared the sun in another story, forcing him to slow down so there were equal periods of darkness and light each day. The Hawaiian mystical worldview allows for different gods and spirits to imbue any aspect of the natural world. From this mystical perspective, in addition to his presence in lightning and rainbows, the god of light and life, Kane, can be present in rain and clouds and a peaceful breeze, typically the home of Lono. Although all food and drink had religious significance to the ancient Hawaiians, special cultural emphasis was placed on the awa, or kava, due to its narcotic properties. This root-based beverage, a psychoactive and a relaxant, was used to consecrate meals and commemorate ceremonies. It is often referred to in Hawaiian chant. Different varieties of the root were used by different castes, 
and the brew served as an introduction to mysticism. Hawaiian youth learned life skills and religion at home, often with grandparents. For bright children, a system of apprenticeship existed in which very young students would begin learning a craft or profession by assisting an expert or kahuna. As spiritual powers were perceived by Hawaiians to imbue all of nature, uh, experts in many fields uh, of work were known as kahuna, a term commonly understood to mean priest. Um, the various types of kahuna passed on knowledge and or of their profession, be it in genealogies or melee or herb medicine or canoe building or land boundaries by involving and instructing apprentices in their work. More formal schools existed for the study of hula and likely for the study of higher levels of sacred knowledge. The kahuna took the apprentice into his household as a member of the family, although often the tutor was a relative. During a religious graduation ceremony, the teacher consecrated the pupil, who thereafter was one of the teacher in psychic relationships as definite and obligatory as blood relationships. Like the children learning from their grandparents, children who were apprentices learned by watching and participating in daily life. Children were discouraged from asking questions in Hawaiian culture. In Hawaiian ideology, one does not own the land but merely dwells on it. The belief was that both the land and the gods were immortal. This then informed the belief that land was also godly and therefore above mortal and ungodly humans and humans therefore could not own land. The Hawaiians thought that all land belonged to the gods, the Akua. The Ale were believed to be the managers of the land, that is, they controlled those who worked on the land, the Maka Ainana. On the death of one chief and the accession of another, lands were reapportioned. Some of the previous managers would lose their lands and others would gain them. Lands were also reapportioned when one chief defeated another and redistributed the conquered lands as rewards to his warriors. In practice, commoners had some security against capricious repossession of their houses and farms. They were usually left in place to pay tribute and supply labor to a new chief under the supervision of a new konohiki or overseer. This system of land tenure is similar to the feudal system prevalent in Europe during the Middle Ages. The ancient Hawaiians had the ahupa as their source of water management. Each ahupa had a subdivision of land from the mountain to the sea. The Hawaiians used the water from the rain that ran through the mountains as a form of irrigation. Hawaiians also settled around these parts of the land because of the farming that was done. The remains of small sea creatures are providing archaeologists with fresh insights into one of the most important periods in the history of pre-contact Hawaii. A new study of indigenous temples, or heiau, on the island of Maui has set out to identify when the island's native population that was initially spread out over several small chiefdoms first came together under a single ruler. Now the island's sacred sites range from small shrines dedicated to deities of fishing and agriculture to monumental temples whose foundations are still identifiable today says Dr. Patrick Kirch of the University of California at Berkeley. Maui is one of the few places in the Hawaiian Islands where the archaeological landscape of an entire ancient district is still intact, not disturbed either by plantation, agriculture, or modern tourism, or housing developments. Hayao vary tremendously in size and form, and there were different kinds of hayao for different gods, he explained. When in use, they had, matched, uh, they had thatched buildings to hold temple paraphernalia, wooden images, wooden oracle towers, etc., but all of those perishable structures are now gone. What we see as archaeologists are the stone foundations, generally platforms or terraces, or sometimes walled enclosures. And with his colleagues, Kirch has been investigating these sites in search of a unique and durable artifact pieces of small stony coral 
known as Posilipera meandrin, meandrin. The coral branches were placed as offerings on altars and sometimes incorporated into the stone walls during construction. Kirch explains, we do not know the exact ideology behind this, but there are hints in Hawaiian tradition that the corals may have represented the god Kane, the god of flowing waters, irrigation, and the taro plant, or possibly the god Lono, the god of dryland farming and the sweet potato. While their precise purpose remains unclear, the corals are nonetheless useful because they can be scientifically dated. So although the Heiau's original structures have vanished, archaeologists can study the fragments of coral that were sometimes left as offerings at the altars of Heiau or were even built into the construction of the temples, useful for archaeologists because it can then be scientifically dated, and this can be crucial. Um, corals left there to determine when they were constructed and used, and then the corals are clues in tracing the island's political development. According to Kirch, signs of the temple building boom would likely indicate a period of political consolidation as ancient Hawaiian rulers often ramped up their religious authority in order to also wield economic and political authority. And of course, this is the period of the mature advanced and theocratic chiefdom. Often this involved building shrines and temples near farmlands and other areas of food production. This strengthened the symbolic association between rulers and the gods and controlled nature's bounty and made it easier for lead leaders to reap tributes from local growers. The Hawaiian polities were fundamentally based on agricultural production. The chiefs and kings extracted surplus production from the commoners and used this to underwrite their own interests such as supporting craft specialists and warriors. Kirch and his colleagues dated the sites by uranium thorium radiometrics that analyzed the corals' levels of uranium, which decays into the element thorium at a predictable rate. And their analysis of 46 coral samples from 26 of the temple sites suggests that most of the heiau were built more recently and more rapidly over a span of no more than 150 years, ending around the year 1700. First of all, the new dates are important, not just because of their high precision, Kirch says, but in the past we've had to use radiocarbon dating, which has much wider error ranges and calibration issues. With the uranium-thorium coral dating, we are getting error ranges of about 2 to 10 years at two standard deviations, and this is a huge advance in chronological precision. So, from the ATC to the Slave Stage Kingdom, Second, the new results confirm that the Maui temples were constructed in a relatively short period of time with a duration of about 150 years at maximum between about 1550 to 1700. This is the same time during which the Hawaiian oral traditions indicate that Maui Island was consolidated into a single kingdom and that under the reigns of King Pilani and his successors Kia'a Pilani and Kama Lalawalu. What's more, the team's results suggest that a peak of temple construction occurred between 1572 and 1603 when eight temples were built farther inland. This is consistent with the known settlement patterns of the region. Uh, when most people lived and farmed in the uplands where there was enough rainfall to grow sweet potatoes and taro. Many of the temples in the upland zone seem to be associated with the two main gods of agriculture, Kane and Lono. Building monuments to these gods in these agricultural areas likely sent a clear message from King Pilani and his successors to the people of Maui. We conclude that rapid temple construction was part of the overall political strategy used by these rulers to consolidate power, control agricultural production, and extract surplus. Reporting their findings in the Journal of Archaeological Science, Kirch and his colleagues write that their study underscores the importance of monumental ritual architecture in the emergence of archaic states in ancient Hawaii. And then I give the reference for the journal. Now, Kirch explains that temple creation was an important part of ensuring political consolidation by the chiefs. 
ancient rulers of Hawaii increased religious authority by building temples and shrines and bolstering the importance of both. Thus, this allowed them to wield economic and political authority, and it's thought that the placement of religious sites near agricultural land created a symbolic connection between the leaders and the gods who were believed responsible for the bounty of food. Due to this increased association, tributes of the harvest would be directed to the leaders more readily. Hundreds of years ago, the coral were built into the walls of shrines and temples, and they were also left as offering on altars. Now, even though we do not know the exact ideology behind this, there are hints in Hawaiian tradition that the corals may have represented the god Kani and of the flowing waters, irrigation in the taro plant, and possibly lono, um, dry farming in the sweet potato. And re restudy of the dating on 26 Maui temple sites via uranium thorium has given Kirch and his fellow investigators a very tight window of 1550 to 1700 for their construction, and on some specific temples, an even smaller and more specific window of construction opportunity. And it was in this period of time that the final transition to class division and state organization to the establishment of a slave-based economy, meaning that even though not everybody, all the commoners were slaves, I think the common denominator for what has to be paid in terms of wages to commoners is determined by the cost of what it, by what it costs to keep a slave alive. At any rate, that brings us to a conclusion of this Lecture 65B, and as I say, I've got uh, several months of work to do in getting these last two volumes ready, along with the first two being revised, um, well, brought, brought up to date, and so I'm not quite sure when we'll do any more of these particular lectures on Hawaii, but it might be sooner than the, it might be this year, but it may well, very well be in January of next year. So with that, we're going to conclude our lectures on Polynesia for the moment, and I um, hope to see, I hope you get to all get this book on communism in Oceania when it appears in January.